Hi everyone, and welcome to this presentation. We are going to talk about aging today. Now, some people don't want to get older, but we're going to show you how to look that way for your next character. A lot of people end up going to the books and videos or try to find videos on how to do age lines. And unfortunately, there are no videos out there. there on all the books that I've read, they all say age, boom. And it straight, takes you straight to nasolabia fold, crow's feet, and bags. But it doesn't tell you at what age those start appearing and what age you should be able to progressively make those longer or bigger. That's what we're going to discuss today. So you're going to find in this presentation how to do a basic makeup and also the different stages of aging and what causes aging. So you can take that information and put it for your next character. If you're on stage, if you're doing a cosplay character, or if you're doing something for Halloween. Not everybody looks young. The old hags have got to have some age lines. So join us with that you're going to learn what's called the gene techniques and these are things i developed because i've been teaching young people how to do makeup for the last 25 to 30 years and i have found there's certain ways for you to understand this and this is what we're going to discuss in this presentation so let's get to it when does your body start showing aging that's a trick question because there's a couple answers to it. And this is why most people don't know what age is because young people think, oh, it's dad, he's old. And he'll make him look like grandpa. So we're gonna break that down. Here's the thing, biology tells us when aging starts happening. And what happens is that when, you have, when you're a teenager and you have all these wonderful growth spurts that you love, because you're gonna make that six foot mark, in reality, you're only gonna be five nine, but you hope to be that six foot is that the day you stop growing this tall is the day you start aging. So for girls, that could be as early as 15, 16, 17 years old, guys 17, 18, 19. Because what happens is that your cells continue to reproduce but not at that fast rate and they start slowing down as you get older and the older you get, the slower and slower the cells reproduce and now aging is nothing but your skin hanging off your skeleton. Yeah, isn't that graphic? But that's what aging is. So the question is, can we speed it up? Yes. By doing what? What can we do to speed up the aging process? Yes. Lines and shadows? No, what can we do to our body to, bring, to increase the aging process? The sun. Too much sun exposure. What? Have children. Have children. It's called stress. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Okay, so smoking. Drinking, excessive drinking, we're talking alcohol, not milk. We're talking stress. We're talking sun exposure. We're talking all those kind of, even bad health. So basically what I suggest is look at a college kid right after graduation. They're gonna look five to 10 years older because they've gone through four years of all of that. Exactly, I have college kids look younger when they leave college because they now have jobs, they're not stressing over student loans, they've got regular sleep patterns and stuff like that, and so that helps. So with that information, we know that your, your daily life schedule can affect how old you look, correct? So here's what I want you to do, is I want you to think about when you're creating a character, what is their lifestyle like? Where do they live? What time period is it? Do they live in an air-conditioned, climate-controlled environment? Do they live in a rural area? Do they live, if you're gonna do a demon, do they live in hell or not? You know, <laughs> how's that affecting that look? Because not everybody ages the same way. And so if you start your backstory by establishing their style of livelihood or their lifestyle, you can determine, wow, they had a really rough time in the 1890s Maybe they should look a little bit older. They should look a little more weather-worn. They should look a little more sunburned. But they're only 35. That's okay, because now you've established the time period and their livelihood. You can Google anything you want. Googling is gonna be your best friend because this is where your research is. Is 1930s a good time to be living in America? You would think so, it's a musical. But not really. If you go back and Google Chicago, Chicago 1930s, there was post-depression, there was the war, there was you know, prohibition, there was a lot of stuff going on, and it was not a good time, but it's a musical. So when you're establishing a character, start by understanding that, 
And then you can go from there to the different stages of that. So here's how we can study the human body and how that looks in real time to people. I want you to do this one thing. I want you to start collecting photographs. We call it the makeup morgue or the makeup collage. And start collecting photographs, download it on your cloud, download it on your media, however you want to do it, and drop it into three files. The files are going to be this, 18 to 35, 35 to 55, 55 plus. When you start dropping pictures of real people into those, you're going to start saying, wow, I, I'm not sure if they're 35 or they're you know, 25. A great place to start is with family photos because you've got grandparents, moms and dads, aunt and uncles, you know, older brothers and sisters or whatever that you can actually document about every 10 years and establish what they look like when they were about 18 to 35, right out of high school, and go on up to being grandparents. Start with that, and then you'll have a reference of where you can drop in other people. Some may be your favorite celebrities. If you want to get into some of the older celebrities, go back to Dustin Hoffman. He's got a history. A wonderful history of how he's looked over the years. You've got Robert Redford. I'm talking about some old people now to you guys. But if you want to talk to about some of your younger actors, Johnny Depp, he's now up into his 40s and stuff. He has changed a lot from his first days of acting. Start dropping those in. And then you'll start seeing how lines start appearing on their faces over a period of time. And if you're truly a friend of theirs, you'll understand, wow, he has got a drug problem. He's an alcoholic. And then look to see how their lifestyle has affected their look. That is your documentation. That is your research. That's where you're going to go to every time you create a character of what real people look like so you can have a reference. Okay? So get those three time frames down, and we'll show you how that looks in aging in just a second. The biggest thing with aging is the thing is, it's the hardest thing to learn. It really is because you're manipulating light. You're taking light on a flat surface and you're bending it so it looks like a wrinkle. So this isn't going to come easy. It takes practice, practice, practice. So always do your practice before you get into an assignment, a gig or something like that and make it your own. But if you keep your shadows and highlights in the same direction, then you're going to have a great character. So let's get started on some basic makeup and we'll let's age our young lady to see how old we can make her look today. Okay, come on up. Let me see right there. And your name is? Emmeline. Emmeline. Emmeline is actually how old? 14. 14. And this is our typical high school student, right? So with that, we're going to start with some basic skin prep because high school students have such pristine skin, don't they? But they have a lot of physical activity that produces a lot of oils and street makeup and everything like that too. So what we're going to do is we're going to clean her skin first. I just do an alcohol wipe down, okay? Because soap film, we don't want on there. We don't want any street makeup. We want to make sure all the makeup's going to bond to the skin as it was designed on clean skin. There we go. Now, when you do any character in, a, in performance, and I'm talking performance of anything with any kind of special lights, not everyday makeup necessarily for performance. So cosplayers, you're performing. Um, theater people, you're performing. Halloween, haunted houses, you're performing. So you're active, you're moving, you're under special lights and stuff like that. This is the approach we're going to use on creating characters in a performance environment. So now, say we want to protect your skin so she's not sweating and stuff. Also, if you've done makeup, you realize sometimes when I'm aging makeup, the makeup seems to like disappear. It soaks in or something, it just like disappears. It is soaking in. You're introducing a nice cream onto your skin and your skin's going, oh, I'll just suck that right into the pores. But we can stop that. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a layer of barrier spray down. Take a deep breath for me and hold it. Keep your eyes closed. And it just takes a couple squirts across the face. You can go ahead and breathe. Keep your eyes closed. This now sets up a barrier so the makeup's going to sit right on top of the barrier. It's not going to soak in. So if we was to do a green or a red for a troll or a witch or something like that, it won't stain. It'll also make it come off easier because it's not bonded to the skin. So that's a great thing if you're going to be doing those shows that require <laughs> creatures of those colors. Um, if you're going to do straight makeup, we can use just the regular foundation. So what's nice about foundations, uh, the rule of thumb is this. When 
do we go with a darker color a foundation? What is the rule of thumb? Do we go lighter, darker? Do we go two, shades, two or three shades darker? Uh, there's a lot of uh, guessing out there with that, and here's my thinking of it, because I do everything from a black box theater of 50 seats all the way to an 8,000 seat amphitheater. So the rule of thumb I have found is anything up to 500 seats, you can basically match the foundation. <coughs> 500 to 1,200, you may go shade darker depending on the lights. The lights are your friends, and so you've got to be able to understand how, the, how much light is on there. If it's going to make you more washed out, you may have to go darker. If it's going to be dimly lit because it's a dark show, you may have to go with the, the lighter version of it. So play to it a little bit. Have your people look at the audience or from the audience, look at the show as you're doing rehearsals and see if you're washed out or not under your specific lights for your shows. Um, most Broadway shows are between 1,200 and 1,500 seats and they kind of match a little bit from, from the actors I've talked to. But again, I just finished a show with 8,000 seats. That's a lot. That's a lot of color out there. So just judge it by that. So we're going to match her skin tone because we're doing it in front of a small house. Uh, what's nice about foundations is that you want to find a foundation that's close to your skin tone. So if you've got undertones, uh, you, can, you can find those. It's really tough to find it if you've never used a company's product before. So a lot of the little mini pro kits that are out there, student kits, have one foundation. So one, one thing we've done is we've come up with a foundation palette that actually has four. And with four, you have a chance of blending colors. You've got yellow undertones that are there, and you've got a better chance of matching out of one palette. And it will save you a ton of money to do that with, but it also has your cheek and lip rouge and high shadows and highlights. So we're going to match her skin tone with the color of this and this one, and I've used this one a lot. So we're gonna use the sponge. Now, watch what happens with the sponge. Because people say, oh, I should never share makeup and stuff. It's true, you don't have to share makeup. But here's the thing, you never share applicators. And if you're not sure where your makeup has been, because some people can't afford to have their own tray, we understand that. But if you don't share applicators, then your makeup's not contaminated. So if you notice what I'm doing is every time the makeup touches the sponge, I flip the sponge. You never let the sponge touch the makeup and the skin twice. Therefore, the makeup's never contaminated and you have a fresh application every single time. Now, there's been some schools of thought out there that that shouldn't even happen. But what I'm asking you students to do is get into the habit of never using secondhand anything. Fresh sponges, fresh brushes will always ensure that your makeup is safe to use. Okay, just good practice, no matter if, you're, if you have to share a color or not because they don't want to buy 13 colors of green for everybody and you're going to use it. You can also put it in a palette. You can whittle it off, make your own little palette, make a little uh, plastic plate and do it that way. But just never use your sponge twice. That's the biggest factor right there. Always sharpen your pencils between each application and you'll never have any problems with contamination. Okay, so now we've evened out our skin tone a little bit. And she looks nice and rosy again. So the foundation is the key to bouncing the light back to the audience. People say, well, you got washed out. Well, your skin is organic. It absorbs some of that light. Whereas the makeup, if it's highly pigmented, will bounce it back to the audience. And that's what we want to have happen. A lot of stuff that you will buy over the counter at your local stores, your your grocery stores and stuff like that are designed for everyday looks. They're not designed for a huge amount of light on them. And so therefore there may not be enough pigment in that to bounce back to the audience. So putting on a heavier shade of a, of, of a lighter color like a rouge or something like that does not make it <coughs> any more intense. It's just a chalkier version of the same thing. So getting on to products that have high pigment, and I mean pigment is the color that we put into the products. We put up to 60% pigment in a lot of the products. That's a lot compared to some things that may have 10 to 20%. So getting something that's highly pigmented allows you to be very, very flexible because you can do it for every day. You can use it for performance. You can use it for video shoots and photography with the same product. It just depends on how you put it on. So you'll save a lot of money by buying products with high pigmented uh, bases and foundations in it, okay? So now we have a nice flat look. Most actors will go on stage looking just like this. And this is why what I was called wallpaper. They look very flat, there's no dimension, there's nothing there. Makeup is nothing but an illusion. 
It's a magic trick. Because from this point on, whatever I paint on her face, I want you to understand this is the shape of her nose, this is the shape of her eyebrows, this is the shape of her cheekbones, because I'm going to alter her face by simply dropping in some shadows and highlights. That's the secret. And that's how I become a different character. Because you're never going to play yourself. You're playing another character, so you need to be able to alter that to become that. So here's how we're going to do that. So we can use the same shadows and high or the cream highlights. So wherever I paint a highlight tells the light, I want you to focus on this spot. So what we're going to do is we're going to come down here, we're going to go to the bridge of the nose. And then the cheekbones are right here. They're not through the rosy area here. The bone is actually up in this area. So we can drop in some highlight there. And then if you feel this ridge right here, there's a little indentation right here where the temple is, okay? Which means there's a high ridge here. So we're gonna come over and highlight this area right in through here. We're gonna do both sides, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna split her face and do age on one side and then basic on the other, so you'll see a before and after. This is establishing the bone structure of the face. Now, we can go ahead and do a little bit on the eyebrow. Now, the eyebrows are the, the, where all the character is. So raise your eyebrows for me. Look at that. If I put makeup a lot around there or just do solid colors, you'll lose that expression. So we're gonna drop some highlight right underneath here at the arch. So when she raises her eyebrows, the light's gonna pick that up and make it pop out. And yes, ladies, if you're doing this for everyday makeup, this is why you do it this way. So we can see those eyes. The chin, we can establish a wide chin, a narrow chin, one that's shallow or really, really deep by simply putting the highlight wherever that character is gonna have it. Okay, I'm gonna do a little flared nostrils. Now, if you notice, I painted straight down, but if I wanted her nose to be flared out at the end, we'd come out here and make it wider, or we can make it narrower, we can make it any shape we want. That's your new character. This is not your nose, this is your character's nose. So we can make it longer by extending it up here, we can make it longer by dropping it down, or we could cut it off here, depending on the shape that we want. Then we would come over here and do a little bit of shadows. Now the shadows can be anything from a darker foundation. Um, you can pick it up right off your tray, if it's, if it's dark enough or not. You can go really, really light. It just needs to be dark enough to where the light drops off. So wherever the light is dropping off, and again, you can be start with a darker one and go lighter if you need to. Um, there are contour colors that are out there, but if you've got several different colors of foundations, they would work as well. I'm just gonna come in here and establish the crease of the eye so we can see what's behind it. and connect it to the corner of the nose because that's where it is. This, wherever you have a highlight, you have to have a shadow to tell the light where to drop it off. It has to be directional. Otherwise, it's just a glare. And we'll blend these out in a second. Now, this one's a little tricky because we've got a highlight and highlights. So we're going to drop and do a shadow right here where that indentation is, that temporal ridge. Now, I'm gonna take a sponge and I'm gonna come over here and blend these because the bones are not sharp edges. You do not want a sharp line anywhere on a highlight and shadow. The bones are rounded, so they should just round off and fade in and out of each other, okay? So we're just gonna take this and soften it up. Come down here with the nose. So you should never see where the makeup stops and starts. It should just blend naturally. Okay, now we can come back over and hit the shadows the same way. Now here's a trick with the nose. A lot of people will spend a lot of time and will reshape their nose because you have a dark side on each side of the highlight. And it's really easy to mess that up. 
So a lot of people will, will keep rubbing up and down and they become mud in the middle of it. So a quick and easy way is if you take your sponge and just curve it, you're gonna grab this side, this side, and this side, and you can just simply go down like this and you've erased the edge on both of those, but yet the highlight and shadow are still there. And if you have, if you got, if you got a heavy hand and you've got it too much, you can go back and just drop it back in again. But that's the practice part of it. So for the purposes of the camera, I'm going to bump it back out a little bit so you guys can see it. Remember, this takes practice. So as you're doing this, keep a soft touch. A lot of people get really heavy handed or if you use something that's really heavily pigmented, it's way too dark and then you spend a lot of time wiping it off. Okay, so let's soften that one and that one. Now, if you look in the forward now, you can see we've established her bone structure, haven't we? And you can see that. You see there? Exactly. So this is the beginning of the character. Every character should have some definition of their face on any side stage. Because you need to let the audience know you have a nose. You have cheekbones and you have eyes. Putting eyeshadow on a lipstick is not definition. This is the bone. Your lips and your eyeshadows are just accenting where you want the color, but everybody should have bone structure developed someplace so that the audience can see that you're not flat faced. And this is how we do that, okay? <coughs> now, powdering down is another key factor. How many of you have done the lines and stuff like that and it's like they disappeared? Well, we talked about that, that sometimes they'll soak in. The barrier spray would stop that. But powdering, we found out over the years that you don't have to wait till the end of your makeup to powder. In all the books, it says the last thing you'll do is powder. Well, now we found out you don't have to. Makeup's changing over the years, powders have changed over the years, and so what it allows us to do is you can powder down anytime you want the makeup to stop. If you're done with your shadows and highlights and you do not want it to blend in with your age lines and stuff like that, you can powder it down right now. Now, always use a neutral set powder. A neutral set will not leave any color behind, so you can use it on any color foundation and stuff like that. It's not going to interfere with your shadows and highlights. And I use a velveteen puff. Don't use a cotton ball. Please don't use a cotton ball. And don't use a brush. Using a brush, I see people do this, and they'll put on a setting powder, and they'll just simply d brush it on. What we have found out is that when you're doing that, by simply doing this, it's putting the powder on the outside of the makeup, but if you're in performance mode, that makeup's gonna shift on you. The reason is that the makeup is still moist behind it and you've dried out the outside surface of it. You've got to dry all the makeup all the way back to the skin and that makeup will last for hours. If it's not, it could crack or just start breaking down on you. So puff allows you to press it in, whereas the brush does not allow you to press it in. You simply use it to dust off, but not to press it. So we're gonna press this in and you simply just roll with it and just push it in. And as soon as the makeup is dry, it will start falling off and then you know you're done. You cannot over powder, that is key. Some people are afraid to, they're gonna to use too much powder and it's, not, it's gonna make their makeup crack. The makeup will fall off when it's done. There's nothing to grab it. So you can't over powder. You can put too much powder on the puff and that'll just cause a lot of fall off, but as soon as you press it in, now you're done. So now I can go to the next step, and that would be the aging. And then I would powder down that when we're done, because those lines are gonna be fresh and they're gonna be the wet stuff that's on top. But all this stuff is now permanent, it's set. So that's a great way to do staging. So if you're in a hurry, you have to step back, you do this in the first act, and you gotta go aging for second act for a different character, you can just put it right over the top. Powder, put it over the top. Powder, put it over the top. You can just layer it. It's great for that, yes. So what would you recommend for a very large cast? Would you have like that many powder puffs or is that something that they might use? Powder puffs are cleanable. Right. What's well, nice. So it's nice to have a puff per person right. and then you can clean them each night and they'll dry up by the next morning. Okay. Um, what we found out too, as long as you have powder on the puff, there's no transfer of makeup on it, which means you're not gonna have all this color and stuff on it. But having names on the back allows you to do that. Um, we want you to use puffs because it gives you the nice flexibility of having the, the fingers to push it in. 
if you're on a tight budget and you're doing like a lot of schools and stuff like that, the best thing is you can take like a nice toilet tissue and wrap it around and just tear off what you're not needing, but you need that puff to push. Otherwise you're gonna have fingerprints or finger impressions and it won't give you that even look. So the powder puff is key with that. But for, for, for budget purposes, and again, I teach around the country, uh, for little kids, a toilet <laughs> tissue wrapped around it really, really works nicely for that, okay? So we're gonna start aging you, dear. We're gonna do just this side over here, okay? So we're gonna play that out to the house there. So what we talked about is what three age groups? 18 to 35, 35 to 55, 55 plus. We're gonna show you how that looks. Because everybody has been doing Again, the standard lines, nasal labia fold, that's what it's called. We have crow's feet, the three lines up here, and we have the bags underneath here. That's what everybody seems to put on people for age. I'm sorry, age is a whole lot more than that. But those are your basics, and all the books give you just those lines. So what I like to do is I've taught it with enough students that we have found some shortcuts. You, want, you have to use creams. Powders just won't give you that edge. They won't give you that blendability necessarily. Um, but using a lot of cream on a brush may be too much for some people because you're trying to get a really sharp line. And I see a lot of frustration with students who get too much product in there, then they're blending it out and they're wiping it out and their lines are like this instead of like sharp. So a secret I've get, come up with is to use an eyebrow pencil. And what's cool about this is you can get different colors pretty quickly. Everything from a black to a dark brown, a medium brown, or whatever you've got. Leave the pencil, never come at an actor with a pencil that's sharpened in their face like this. If you lay your pencil down and twist it as you're going, you're gonna get a nice line off of it and it will sharpen itself as you're going. When you do this, it breaks the tip off and then you have crumbs on their face. And plus you're going at them with a sharp object. That's never fun, <laughs> especially if you don't know who your artist is. But sharpening as it goes gives you a chance to do lines. So we're gonna start over here with the corner of the nasal labia fold. And see, I can just lay it down and get a little bit of a line. We're gonna come over here and do a little bit of a bag. But I'm not gonna do the complete bag. And here's the gene technique. If you simply take your typical age lines and divide them into thirds to reflect those three age groups, it will look like 18 to 35, 35 to 55, 55 plus. Dad will never look as old as grandpa on stage again. Most people just go straight and do the entire line, okay? So we're doing that. We're doing a line that is 18 to 35 right here with the nasal labia. We're doing a little, a little bit of a bag there. And then we're gonna come over here. And if you take a flat brush, I like the angled ones because I can do almost any angle with it. You lay that brush right onto that line and you pull upward. The shadows go up, the highlights go down and you leave that sharpness right at the base of that line and just pull it away. When you do that, it makes the line, makes the, the skin look like there's a crease there. What you want on the bone is a nice curved surface. What you want on a wrinkle is a very nice V shape. So you want the sharpness of the color to be at the bottom of that and as it pulls up the fatty tissue, it disappears. What you're simulating is the fatty tissue rolling and the skin here, so the, here's the bag, here's the, the, here. So the sharpness is in this V right here. Shadows are going up, highlights are going down. That's it, okay? So look at this, I've put the shadows in. Now when I drop in her highlights, look how much this is gonna pop. You take that flat brush again and go right along where that, you establish that shadow and you pull in the opposite direction. And it makes that line just pop right out of there. This turn. Okay. Now you can see already how, it's di how different it is from the smooth side over here. This is what I call the college age look after finals. <laughs> you've got a little bit of a bag, you've got a little bit of a, and that, that's pretty cool, isn't it? So that's the start of those. Now, when we do crow's feet, uh, crow's feet are usually 
take the longest because people are doing three lines and they've got mud in the middle of this because all three lines are coming together at the same point. My suggestion is the illusion is you want the lines to connect. In reality, you don't have to. If you simply start using the width of your brush or pencil as your starting point and then start your lines out from there, the lines will never connect, but the illusion is from a distance that they continue to the corner of the eye. And that gives you now enough space to have your shadows and highlights in between the lines. So give me a little bit of a squint. Yeah, no lines. Okay, so we, do, we can't use the actor's real lines, which is typical of the youth. So I'll just draw them in. They're not connected, but now I've got all this room to do the highlights and shadows. So the shadows are going which direction? Up. Exactly. And again, if this pencil is a little light for your, for your theater, then you can get darker pencils. But this is something we're using for right now. This is just, it's a darker, it's a dark brown, but it's a, on the lighter side compared to some other brands. Dark brown is, doesn't read as dark brown sometimes because it's so heavy in the brown, but See, I can reestablish the sharpness of that again by coming right along the white or the highlight and establish. And so if it gets a little bit muddy, I can do that. And the other thing with wrinkles, they just don't magically appear. So there's no stopping and starting. So if, when you finish your lines, if, you, if you'd hate the fact that it just magically just stops there, Take your, your, your sponge, or you can take a clean finger, and if you hit both surfaces, <coughs> pull those lines in the direction they're going, pull both colors, and then the lines disappear into the fatty tissue. So the lines should never just stop. They should fade away into the fatty tissue. So I can do the same thing with any of the lines. If they're abruptly just there, go back and just pull them, okay? So this is what we would have for an 18 to 35 year old. Is that working? Now, a lot of times we can drop in if they're a worrier. He's a worry wart. He's always worrying about everything. He may have forehead lines because he's constantly worrying about stuff. So we could drop some forehead lines in. Forehead lines I don't do as often uh, because a lot of people are wearing hats and wigs. Any show that you're doing before 1960 in America, everybody wore hats. If a guy's wearing hats, don't worry about the forehead lines because the hat's going to, going to come down and wipe them out anyway. So watch your shows. If you're doing things like The Music Man, indoors, outdoors, indoors, outdoors, those hats are constantly moving. If you're doing shows like Arsenic and Lois, it's all indoors. So good, they can take the hats off and your forehead lines will work. Another thing that ruins that or will smudge those will be the edge of a wig. And if you were doing a show where they have a lace front wig, that lace front's gonna come down farther and that lace will constantly rub on those. So you may just be able to scratch those. So I don't do them as often as I used to because now we're using a lot more wigs in shows. And in characters, cosplay use a ton of character uh, wigs for that. So raise your eyebrows for me. Oh yeah, you got a couple of nice ones. Keep it up there. So if an actor has two distinct lines like this, this is gonna look really, really bad. It's gonna look like a headband out to the audience. So the illusion is she would have multiple ones. So we could come back over and we can erase part of it and make four. And that will give more of the illusion of the lines and not look like a headband. So now we're just gonna do the same thing we've done to the other lines. Just take the shadows and go up with it. Now again, your character, and I would love to see shows and characters where you may have half a dozen characters all the same age, but they all look different because they would all be different. So a show that's really tough to do on stage is The Crucible. The Crucible, there's like 20 some odd cast members in there ranging from age 12 to ancient. 
And an ancient back then would have been probably 60, but they usually age her to like 80 years old. And 20 cast members, there's a lot of different ages in there, but they all look the same on a lot of shows because they don't know how to do this. So breaking that up so that you have them all looking the same. I mean, you may have two ladies that are completely different examples. If you're doing arsenic and no lace, they're sisters. They're in their probably 70s to 80s, but their personalities are so different, which means their makeup or their age lines may be different. One's a busybody, she's worrying about everything. The other one's a little socialite. She may not have as many wrinkles. So that's where you start developing your own character, and that's what's fun about making every single person on stage different, not generically the same. Okay, so we got the highlights and the shadows there. <coughs> Come back through and blend out the edges. Now we have four headlines. Okay. Now, that's 18 to 35. Now we're going to take it up a notch. We're going to go 35 to 55. So this is going to be where the parents come in, that age group. Okay, so we're simply going to take those same lines and we're going to extend them another third. So we're going to come over here and start doing the bag a little bit heavier. It's going to be a little bit bigger in the bottom perhaps because maybe mom's worried now. She's had a couple of kids. And we're going to blend those out. And the crow's feet can be lengthened a little bit. Oh yeah, you're looking a little tired there, girl. Highlights, you have to have a highlight. If you don't put any highlights around your shadows, they'll just look like dark marks on the skin. When I'm watching shows, I'll know right away how their highlights and stuff did. If they're together or if they forgot one of them, you'll see right away. I know I'm using the back of my hand, but I just sanitized it, so it's, it's okay. But palettes are really good for this too. If you need to thin it out on your brush, take your brush and thin it back and forth so you don't have globs. That's what the palettes are for. We all learn little tricks along the way. Sometimes they're bad habits, sometimes they're okay. But when you're in a hurry doing shows, you do what you have to. Teachers, I know that for fact, because you tell me all the time, I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> I don't have those kind of resources. What can I do? So these are tricks that I've learned along the way, okay? Now, there we go. That's a little bit older. It's a little bit different. The lines are a little different. You know, again, if I really wanted to make a big difference, I would drop the forehead lines out of the younger version and drop them in with the 35 to 45, 35 to 55. And that would make a nice distinction between the two. So those are where the wrinkles are going, okay? Making sense? You're saying, wow, she looks old. <laughs> okay, so now we get into what everybody calls is old. It's getting older, it's not just old, okay? So now we're gonna get into, we're gonna continue this bag around. And what would be fun is that you can drop this, this bag in and drop in more crow's feet off of it. So the crow's feet are even more predominant. And this bag gets a little bit heavier in the middle. This one comes all the way down to the corner of the mouth. And then we'd also get the corner of the mouth turned down. When you do the research, you'll say, well, that person's in the 80s, I know, because it's grandma, but she doesn't have those lines. That's okay. But grandpa's got a lot of them, okay? Then make grandpa have a lot of them. So that's what I mean, use the research, people, please. There's a lot of people out there. I like to sit in airports and watch people, not stalk them, just watch them. But I look at them and say, okay, I'd like to hear their backstory because they look fascinating because there's a lot of character in here. I wanna know what their, their past has been or the way they walk or the way they're handling themselves because that's a future potential character on stage. You can take those references and use those. So study real people. You're not gonna find real people that you can study on social media. It's all screened. They want you to know what they want you to know. But you get to know the real person, you go meet them. <laughs> 
So now we've got these lines are just continuing down. Okay, so meeting real people is key because you're portraying other people. The more you study them, the more realistic your character is going to be. Now, if you have an avatar you're trying to create, that's a whole different thing. So we're just going to create, drop in these highlights again. These are where the lines are going. You will create your own. We can drop a little highlight right in here. Right about this, yeah. Yeah. So aging is a process that everything affects everything. I mean, it affects everything in the aging process. So it's not just wrinkles. So when you get to a point of the skin is shifting all over the place, so there'll be wrinkles that'll pop up everywhere. Uh, as we're younger, we have nice full lips and they're always full of color and stuff. If you want that actor to lose some of that fullness to portray an older person, you can actually come back over with foundation over the edge of the lips, get it powdered down, and then that will shrink the amount of redness that's there, allowing you to be able to do the now lip lines. And these are the crackles or the cracks around the lips that if you have enough flesh tone there, it allows you to be able to do those pretty easily. If you have a lot of redness, it doesn't look old enough. So now these get blended to the side. You can pick a left or right, either one, as long as it's the same direction, clear across. And these lines you want to disappear into the fatty tissue around the mouth as well. Now, grandma may wear lipstick, and she may fill these cracks in, but I would keep the cracks there and just put the lipstick in between it so they can see it. When you're creating characters, please be mindful of when grandma grew up. If grandma grew up in the early 1800s, because your show's 1930, grandma would have never wore makeup. So don't because you think that because your grandma wears makeup that your character would. Do the research. Okay, we're going to blend those up. Okay. Okay. Here we go. The reading. Looks different in there. See how we manipulate the light with the shadows and highlights? That's what it's about, okay? So now, let's continue, because all this nice, smooth jawline actually is gonna sag down to here. So we're gonna sag the jawline. You're going, <coughs> what's he talking about? To do this, here's a fast way. You can do this with creams. I found, again, another way that we can do this pretty quickly. Um, is when you look in the mirror, never look in the mirror, try to do this on yourself and, and look away because you're gonna pull the skin and when you come back, it's gonna be up here. So always look and feel where your jawline is and if you're doing it on yourself, put your finger right on your jaw and go below your finger. You'll always be able to do it that way. When you find somebody else or working on somebody else, find their jaw, says, oh, it's right up here. No, the jaw bone is right here. So I want to take it below that. So I'm going to come, I've got pressed powder. It's just simply an eyeshadow, so I have a quick reference. I'm squeezing the brush so I have like a line off of it. And I'm going to drop it down here. And if I need a darker color, I can do that. That gives me some flexibility. There we go. And blend it down. Now this needs to be subtle because it is a shadow. But you can also spray these powders so that they don't just wipe away. Now there is what's called a double dip version of this as well. And what it is, it comes up and does another one like this. So you can do the double dip if you can. This is a basic jawline drop. So it's, her jaw is right here. But look what it looks like. It's down here, isn't it? Yeah. So we come in and we can do the highlight right above that. 
to establish where the light's going to pick it up. Now you can also come over here if you're doing your research and realize that once this sags, there's usually starts to get a little bit of a shadow through here because the jaw has dropped off of a little. So you can put a little bit of here. And that's just a hint. But look at the jaw. It comes all the way down to here. So you do the same on both sides, and again, you can spray all this down. Now, it doesn't stop here. No, there is more. <laughs> so I want you to take your head, and I want you to turn it that way for me. This tendon popping up right here is what you're going to highlight in shadow. So you use the same shadow. Yeah, you got it. It's right there. So we're just going to take it and shadow each side of this. There we go. Okay, look forward. Oh yeah, it's popping up nicely. Now what happens is aging will continue and you'll continue down to the jawline. Oops, sorry, microphone. Uh, I mean, not the jawline, sorry. It's the collarbone. So if your collarbone is showing behind your costumes or around the neckline of your costumes, always highlight and shadow, just like you do the ridge of your nose, their collarbone and the, the aging will stop there. But you do definitely have a collarbone that's distinct. So this, all these lines are coming down to the collarbone and you would simply just shadow each side of that and then highlight it. And then you could come over here and drop in some lines right underneath here. And you have this really nice textured neckline. And that's how we know that you've paid attention because most people will forget to do the neck. And that's when I can tell they didn't think or look to see wh where the aging starts and stops. Now again, these techniques are developed because I know people are frustrated by trying to find this stuff out. And there's really nothing out there that explains it. So that's what we're trying to do here. Okay. Now let's turn at the waist and see if head on. So you've got to break up all that smoothness. If you don't, the age will be here and the smoothness will be down here. Sorry, Mike. And it will give a dead giveaway that it's a young person playing it. When I see a show and it's a high school show and I swear they have staff members in there because they look 50, I know they've done it right. And that's the whole thing. So you've got to be able to do the age all the way down. Now it doesn't stop there. There is more. <laughs> okay, put your hand up to your face. There's that young person. So we have to age the hand. Okay, so <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna cheat it this way, okay, to the camera. So I need to have you um, give me a fist. What we're gonna do is we're going to create the loose skin around the, the knuckles because we lose some of that that firmness in the back of our hands. And so we start seeing the skin floating around the knuckles. So we're gonna create a hand that looks like mine. <laughs> Grandpa's hands. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take a little cream liner and we're just gonna go in here and fill in the creases on her second knuckle. Relax a little bit. Don't hurt me. And that's gonna force it right down into those creases. Then, okay, open up your hand. Oh, there it is. We go back with the foundation that we had, and then we're gonna go down the fingers. So we hit just the tops of the skin, exposing all the wrinkles or all the crevices. Now her knuckles look like mine. <laughs> okay, now you can do that. I do the second knuckle because that's the most prominent of all the knuckles. You have your first and second and they're a little tougher to do that with. But also we lose some of the, the, the tissue, the fatty tissue uh, in our hands. So we start seeing if you flex your hand backwards, you're gonna see the tendon that goes from here back to your wrist. 
And so we start seeing that tendon pop up more prominently as we get older. So we're gonna do the same thing on her. So we're just gonna come back. Oops, so we're gonna shadow first between the fingers. And that'll line up with the tendons. Now I have had some people that will actually shadow each side of the finger. You shadow each side of it this way, giving it an indication that we've lost some muscle tissue between the fingers here. But if you can get the shadows up to the tendon, that's a start. So as you're developing your techniques, this is a starting point of ways of breaking up all that smoothness. <coughs> And we go back over with the highlight again. Let's do this with the sponge. Okay, so now we've broken up some of that smoothness. Okay, so already her hand is not that young, smooth one that we started with. So from that, we look at what other age elements we have, and then we start looking at skin texture. Because a lot of times, up until where there was air conditioning, everybody had to go outside to cool off because it was like stifling inside. And so they wore hats for that reason. Or they were farmers and laborers or factory workers. And so that took a lot of toll on the skin. So it became pitted or became ashy or became whatever. So again, as you're doing the research, look to see, wow, that skin looks like it's kind of like got pits in it from like being you know, on, the, on the coast or it's got embedded coal from being a coal miner and stuff like that. So let's see how we can do texture. This is a great sponge to do this with. This is called the stipple sponge and it's designed for texturing. So you can do a, a beard stubble with it. You can do texturing with like it pitted, but we're gonna do a little bit of texturing to go what it looks like is the skin starts to break down a little bit. So we're gonna start with a little bit of highlights and we're gonna come right along here and hit a little bit of here because she's been outside a lot as an older, as a younger person. So it took some, took some weathering on her skin and we, so we're gonna do it there, and then we're gonna come over here and do the same on her hands. Because her hands gets as much sun as her face, if not more. So those are highlights. Now I got highlights, what do I have to have with it? Shadows. Shadow. Let's make sure I got the clean side. Yeah, there's the combo. So you go back over it and you do the sponge and these are washable too. So these are a lot of fun, but you can combine colors if you get the right combination of colors. Yeah, there's some texture. And we're going over the face the same way. And again, if they're too dominant, then you can go off on softer colors if it's reading too heavy. But that's how we texture the skin up. How's that reading? Pretty yeah. insane, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Now put your hand up there. Yeah, grandma's hands look good. So here's my, here's my clue to young ladies. I know you want to be there for the cast party and you want to be there for the opening night party and stuff like that. But never get a French manicure if you're playing an old lady because we're gonna take it away from you. <laughs> <laughs> so an easier way to do that too, is to mess up the, because it's, it's tough to mess up this area right through here with the fingers. So the suggestion I has, if grandma's been out in the laboring, or been out doing laboring stuff, she's a farm hand, she's you know, out doing her own crops, or she's a factory worker, whatever, take a little bit of an eyebrow pencil and go right along the cuticles. That right there will just, that's where you don't want the manicure. You want to be able to mess them up a little bit. Now the fingers look a little bit more rugged. 
So it's really easy to do this with the texturing if you understand the shadows and highlights. You're using the texture with the sponge. Now here's the thing, this next step is not a beauty mark, so don't start doing little circles. <coughs> it's what's called liver spots. Liver spots is the breakdown of the pigment in the skin. So I call, let's make little jigsaw puzzle pieces. Just roughly do it, and they're random. They're not circles. They usually are gonna appear on the back of the hand and they're gonna appear along this area here. And again, you can, I powder them down at about this point because you can soften them by simply tapping them a little bit to knock that darkness off, or just go ahead and powder it, will do the same thing. Now this is a nice 75, 80 year old look. <laughs> Uh, another way of getting uh, an effect, a nice effect, is if you come over and close your eye for me. If you take your eye shadow and go from this corner all the way down to the corner of the eye and do all this highlight, it will look like the eyelid itself is saggy. So it's another way of doing that. Again, all you're doing is giving the illusion that all the skin that was up and firm is now sagging and hanging off the skeleton. Exactly. <laughs> Tricks of the trade. Okay, so you've got the pucker mouth, you've got all that, you've got the hands, you've got the texture, you're ready to go. These are some very basic elements. So when you're doing eyebrows and facial hair, never do a complete eyebrow that's white. You need that contrast. If you did that, we would lose our eyebrows altogether because we've already done the highlights behind it. That's when you can take uh, a toothbrush. Some people like to use a toothbrush or even the brush in the hair white itself and just hit some of it so it knocks off the stark black that's there. It would be great. On facial hair for the guys, never have a complete white beard because you'll lose the jawline. Can you use a mascara brush if it's clean? Yeah, you can use a disposable one, sure. Uh, and, and toothbrush is a little more available. Some people don't know where to get their disposable mascara or uh, brushes, but I don't. I know where, and obviously you do too. Um, but do salt and pepper beards so you can see the, the jawline of the actor, and same thing with the mustaches. So that's where the, the, the old school comes to them and they use a toothbrush, because that's what was available. The jars have the brushes in them now to do that with. Okay? Try not to do eyelashes. It's such a pain and all you're doing is losing all that color that's around your eyes anyway. So um, I just do the eyebrows and call it quits with that for old age. Any questions about any of this? This is a lot of information. This is like four weeks in a college class. We spend a lot of time on this in the college level because it is the hardest thing to do. And if you really want to see... Whoa. <laughs> I feel so old. So, um, biggest thing, do your research, do the books, do the aging, and if you do this, again, I call this the gene technique because this is what I've developed over the years for people to understand the aging process. And when you do this, it will make sense. I get tons of emails from teachers saying just that one workshop made a huge difference in all my shows because the kids are getting it. So as you're practicing and playing and creating new characters, if you get your shadows going up and your highlights going down and you get those lines manipulated and look, they look really awesome to you, then you're ready, okay? If you're not sure, go back and practice some more. Have fun with it, okay? Great, thanks guys, have fun.